Doctor, are you finding it hard to get your entire team aligned and to a productivity workshop, but you know you deserve growth just like everyone else? Hi, I'm Reagan Robertson, CCO with Productive Dentist Academy, and with over 30 team members myself, believe me, I get it. That's why our co-founders, Dr. Bruce B. Baird and Victoria Peterson, have put together a productivity bundle designed to guarantee your growth in 2023. All you have to do is register to attend a 2023 productivity workshop. And if you do so before December 31st, you will receive 12 months of PDA on demand. That is our entire productivity workshop, including breakouts recorded at your fingertips for a full 12 months after you attend. This is ideal when you bring on new team members, if you add an associate, and to make sure that you have mined every nugget of gold from our award-winning curriculum. You will also receive a 90-minute one-on-one session prior to attending the workshop with a PDA business advisor. This is to help you get the most out of your time before, during, and after your experience so you can customize it and hit your specific goals. We offer this only once a year, and due to capacity, especially with the hands-on attention we provide each attendee, we only have 50 available. It sells out every single year. You can grab yours right now. Go to www.productivedentist.com, and you can click on the Cyber Monday link, or go to www.productivedentist.com slash workshop. If you feel you need it right now, email Brent, B-R-E-N-T, at productivedentist.com. We probably don't even have 50 left at this moment. So I hope to see you. We can't wait and have a wonderful new year. Welcome to Investment Grade Practices Podcast, where we believe private practice dentists deserve to get the lifestyle today while building an asset for tomorrow. Join your host, Victoria Peterson, to design the practice of your dreams and secure your financial independence. Let's get started. Welcome to this episode of Investment Great Practices. And I'm just wondering, have you ever felt stuck in your current fee schedule or trapped in PPO hell? If so, then you're going to love this episode. Today, I have Nicholas Partridge from Five Lakes Dental Practice Solutions. Nick, it's so great to have you here. You've been working with our clients and uh, we are all personally falling in love with you and what Five Lakes can do. Uh, for our doctors. Thank you so much for having me. We feel the same way. So let's dive right into it. This is a you know pretty fast paced podcast. And so tell us in a nutshell, what does Five Lakes do for dental practices? Sure. Uh, so we help dental practices develop and implement and manage on a go forward basis an insurance participation strategy. And I say that because Everybody's trying to do different things, right? Whether you're a group and you're trying to bring practices together and they each have their own uh, insurance participation, or whether you're trying to, uh, whether you're at capacity and you're you're thinking about maybe leaving plans, whether you're uh, fee for service and you're thinking about adding some plans because you're adding an associate or you want to bring up the volume, you know, everybody's at different points uh, in their journey. And so we help people, uh, dental practices, dental groups develop and manage an insurance participation strategy. I'm so glad you said that because um, I am not personally one that thinks insurance is the evil empire. (laughs) I think that um, it serves a purpose. And on one level, how blessed are we as an industry that there is something subsidizing the care for our customers, right? We're not a five-star restaurant. No one gets a, a, you know, a, a steak insurance plan. I wish they did because I would go out to eat more. <laughs> <laughs> so on the one hand, I do know that 68% of patients come when they have an insurance plan. On the other hand, being an office manager and a clinician, I know the restrictions that you feel for treatment planning and delivery. So it's it's one of those things. You said something so potent when you said it's an insurance participation strategy. So it sounds like it depends on where you're at in your life cycle on what's appropriate. So you probably don't have any blanket advice for us today, do you? <laughs> well, you know, we're really an insurance agnostic, right? Like you said, it's a tool, yeah. right? And so if you if you take a step back and you and you ask yourself, you know, what is a dental benefit? 
a dental benefit was created to do two things. One is encourage people to go to the dentist and two is to help them offset the cost of care. And it's really fantastically successful at doing that, right? Now, like you said, there's all kinds of cost containment parameters, you know, that they put in place, whether it be limitations on frequency or, uh, you know, bundling of, of services. They say this is, you know, part of that procedure or whether it's uh, the network itself and the reimbursement rates, there's all kinds of different cost containment measures. But the statistics show that people with a dental benefit are two and a half times more likely to go to the dentist, right? And everybody says the cost of care is the number one barrier, right? And it helps offset the cost. So, so you have to take it for what it's worth, right? And you say, okay, well, based on what I'm trying to do in my practice, based on what I'm trying to do, you know, where, where I'm at, um, you know, you can use insurance to help build your business, right? And so, uh, so that's what we try to do is we try to use insurance to help attract patients, retain patients, um, you know, address reimbursements, you know, but there's a lot of different things you're trying to do, uh, you know, in, in a business. And so uh, it's just one of the, the tools. Now it's very complex and it's ever changing, right? But nonetheless, it's still a tool that you can use in your business, depending on what you're trying to do. All right. I love it. Can I ask you some of the most frequently asked questions I get or some of the things that we see when we're analyzing practices? hundred percent. Yeah, sure. All right. Let's, um, let's go. Let's do it. All right. All right. Number one, this might be like Nick's top 10, and you can jump in here too. Number one is there's still confusion about whether I report to the insurance companies my usual and customary fee and take a write off, or do I load the current insurance plan fee schedule and just report to them what they say they will pay? I, I, I was working with a client this week and they had not changed their fees in 15 years, and they're really disappointed that. Delta Dental is not paying them any more than they have in 15 years, yet they've never submitted their UCR. Yeah, and that's really the problem, right? So you should always submit your UCR. And the reason for that is there's, there's several, but I think the biggest thing is you're declaring, this is what I charge for this procedure in my office, right? And so you're declaring that to the insurance company. You're saying, hey, look, this is where I'm at. And the insurance companies want to offer, if you're in a PPO network, they want to offer a discount to their members. And so they can see where you're at. And then you can come back and say, hey, this is where um, the contract rate is. And, and then you've got room to talk about the, the, the distance between them, right? But if you're only ever filing your contract rates, number one is that's going to put you in, in some uh, legal troubles because then you're charging everybody different amounts based on which insurance they have, if that's your practice, which you can't do. And number two, I get, wait a minute, I didn't know that. So you can't just send United, United and Blue Cross, Blue Cross and be compliant. You're out of compliance if you you're out of compliance. Yeah, because what you're essentially doing then. So like, let's say, for example, for a pro fee, if if you have a, a United Healthcare fee schedule that says maybe that pro fee is $70, but then and you're charging United Healthcare 70, but then for MetLife, if it's 50 and you're charging MetLife 50, if United Healthcare were to find out about that, you've been essentially overcharging their patients $20, right? It's because you get hot water. Oh, very much so. Yeah. So you have to charge everybody the same regardless, right? And that's, that's kind of a general rule of thumb. And so, uh, so the easiest way to do this, to bill your UCR, you bill your UCR, then you can disclose to the insurance company and say, Hey, look, you know, you want me to take a discount. This is too much of a discount. Here's where you're at. Here's where I'm at. Let's, let's talk, you know? So it gives you, it gives you some latitude. I love that. Now, I have also heard about, um, I'm going to call them pop-up groups for lack of better uh, word, but I, I hear about we're starting a group and we're going to go to the, to the insurance companies together as 15 or 20 dentists who otherwise don't know each other, but we're going to go and get leverage on them. Does that work? You know, it's interesting. Um there's so much that's going, there's so much gamesmanship in this, right? In the sense that everybody's trying to, to, to find an angle to do things. And, and I think if you take a step back at the end of the day, you have to understand what the spirit of the arrangement is, right? That you're willing to accept a discounted rate as payment in full in right. exchange for the opportunity to be able to attract more, you know, disproportionately more patients from that network than you would maybe if you were out of network, right? 
And so when you try to get real cute and and uh, and play games to 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 upset that uh, the, the spirit of that agreement, I think you, you might be you know run into some issues. If you're really truly forming a group for the purposes of achieving leverage, not only with payers but with suppliers and labs and things like that, I think that makes total sense. And that's why you're that's one of the many reasons that you're seeing this consolidation in the dental industry. Um, is just because you know fragmented industries uh, tend to be fairly inefficient, right? And so, um, so, so we see that in the dental industry, and that's that's changing now as a result of a lot of different factors. Um, you know, I think going to I see this when I see we've seen some groups where they buy like two practices in Maryland and two practices in Michigan and two practices in Texas, and, and they come to us and they say, well, we've got twenty practices. Well, you don't have scale anywhere. Right. Right. You know, and so my advice, if if you're trying to build a company with the purposes of achieving leverage with specifically payers would be to build density in the market because you're more valuable from that respect, you know, and, and probably from an administrative operational perspective, that way you don't have field, op, you know, field uh, directors of operations, you know, flying from here to there, trying to take care of the two offices here and the two offices there. And um, you know, so I just I don't I don't know that I would form a group specifically for the purposes of negotiating, because, again, it, it depends on oh, there's just so many factors. You know, it's, right. there's it so many factors. Mean, it doesn't feel like there's enough stickiness there. Right. That that they. It's just on paper anyway, so we'll move on. We'll keep moving forward. Um, these are just some of the fun things that pop up. OK, so. There used to be, and maybe there still is, a way for patients to opt out of filing insurance through a HIPAA form or something like that, that they could send to the payer saying, I choose not to have my dentist. Even though they're in network, I choose to not have my dentist uh, file for this particular procedure, and I accept their full fees. Is that a thing? It is. You can still do that. Um... I I've less and less I hear about it, but it's one of those things where I, you know, as a patient, I just I I don't understand why, you know, like and as a doctor, you know, I mean the other thing is too is like if you're trying to get your full fee. Well, I get the point of it. Let's say that it's a fifteen thousand dollar treatment plan and the terms of the contract say you can't bill more than fifteen hundred dollars and their plan limitations. And you yeah. know, but there's a fourteen thousand dollar spread here. So patient opt out and then we can do the treatment. Is that, I'm throwing you curveballs. Yeah, no, but so it's a good question. But a lot of times the the rule, uh, the, the language is more that um, even if you've consumed your maximum for the year, you're, you're still eligible for the discounts thereafter, right? Mm -hmm. And so so if, if you have a $3,000 treatment plan and you consume your $1,500 maximum from insurance, the next fifteen hundred dollars still has to be at that discounted rate, right? Because it's even though you've run out of benefits, it's still an applicable um, service under the benefit, you know. So you have to be careful of those kinds of things. Thanks for letting me throw you these curveballs. You know, oh no, this um, is great. I, you uh, know, <laughs> it's great to get in the, into a, a, a room here where we can just talk insurance, you know, nuances, right? And then right. Uh, well, I, anyway. if, part of building an investment grade practice is building durability and decreasing risk. And so I work with a lot of doctors who are beginning the process of succession planning. And hopefully if they're doing these kinds of things, they're three or four years before succession planning, because you want to clean all of this stuff up. You don't want to have uh, potentially libelous things coming up during a practice valuation. Right. So during a practice valuation, you go through all fee schedules, all insurance. How is that done? And I'm seeing AR that's like out the wazoo because uh, I'll take the example, which is really common. If you're deep in a community, be that yachting or golfing or country club or church and you go, yeah, just bill what insurance states and we'll write off the rest. But A, they don't write it off. B, it stays on accounts receivables. And C, I don't think that's legal. Yeah, right. Well, and I love the principle of this of, of an investment grade practice. Cause to me, 
that speaks to a a, a well oiled machine, right? So durable is certainly one of the, a, a great word for it. I think um, you want it, a lot of times in a practice because uh, there's usually an individual practitioner. From practice to practice, you might see widely varying. Um, behaviors and, and policies and procedures and practices in the office, um, let alone fee schedules and participation and things like that. And what you really want is uh, is good, solid thought and methodology that went into it and training for the team and, and you know, to be a well-oiled machine. So I, I just love what you guys are doing with building investment great practices. I love that. All right. My last little curveball here, <laughs> then we'll get into the building the durable system part. Can you at the bottom, you, you can tell, like I was an office manager where we had, you know, the four colored pens and we were hand sending statements to the, you know, with a little red pen and blue, <laughs> blue colors. So can you still in little tiny font at the bottom of a, a submission say this patient has received a courtesy in our office and that's kind of a blanket. Now the insurance company has to come and find out from you what that courtesy was or, you know, that keeps you legal. Yeah, you absolutely. Um, one of the things that is really important is that because insurance, you know, and I think there's a, so look, I have a couple of things to opine on about this. Number one is that um, dental insurance works very different than medical, right? So people's experience, they come into the dentist, they think it works the same way or they expect it to work the same way and it does not work the same way, right? So there's one, there's an educational component to that and setting the patient expectations up front. Um, number two is when you come in, uh, because insurance is a is oftentimes a percentage, it's a co-insurance, right? So they're going to pay 80% of treatment, not 80% of a fixed dollar amount. They're going to pay 80% of a treatment, you know, that you are obligated to, um, to collect the copay, right? You cannot waive copays because then the, the percentage balance is off, right? If, if you're going to, uh, collect for a, a procedure, you need to collect $100 and you don't, then the insurance company ends up paying a disproportionate percentage of the claim, which is in violation of the policy, right? So, right. so that's one thing. And on top of that, then when you offer courtesy discounts, the insurance company then likewise should share in that discount, right? So if you're going to discount something from $100 to $80, the insurance company also then their percentage that they're going to pay is off the 80, not the 100. You can't just give the, the patient the, the courtesy and make the insurance company pay the full amount. That doesn't work. That, that invalidates the whole uh, logic and, and rules there. So complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's take the moving forward approach. I love what you said. Let's, let's have an insurance participation strategy that allows you to move forward. So let's say like a lot of doctors post-pandemic they are at capacity and patients are saying yes to treatment. It's like, it's almost unprecedented, right? They're like, while you're in here, doc, just do the whole quad or half mouth or knock me out. Patients are now asking for that. So when you're at capacity and we, we evaluate this every day of the week and they're like, I need to hire two more hygienists. I just went through that. And I was like, well, your hygiene salaries, given your write-offs are 56% of net production and you've got 30 40 percent overhead so right now you've got no profit in hygiene i'm not sure i would hire another hygienist two days a week because it doesn't it just makes you busy it doesn't make you profitable so take mm -hmm. a scenario like that where i'm at capacity how do you start slowly weaning off some of these plans that may not be fitting your current because quite honestly, right, when you sign up the plans when you're young and your bread and butter and then your clinical elevates and you stay on them out of habit, it, when, when and how do you reevaluate that and right size the capacity? Yeah, that's a great question. And we're dealing with that as well. Um, a lot of clients we have are, are experiencing what you're talking about where they're at capacity and they're saying, hey, wait a second, you know. And so I think the questions... Um, so we have a methodology for this, right? And, and it, it involves a number of pieces, but like, I think the thing you start with is understanding um, where you're getting your patients from today, yeah. right? So what is your patient mix? Because a lot of times people say, well, go after the lowest fee schedule, but the lowest fee schedule is usually your highest uh, producing uh, plan. Usually it's like a Delta or MetLife, right? Um, they're kind of like dealing with Walmart. You know, it's about volume at low prices, right? That's kind of what you're you're signing up for. And so 
you don't normally just go in and, and fire your lowest paying uh, you know, that's not the approach that we espouse, right? So we were going to go collect some information. We're going to look at your patient mix. Where are you, where are your patients coming from? We want to go through the patient roster itself. And we want to figure out who these people are. You know, it would, we'd hate to do that for the, the school district, right? Or s- some source of, of patients that would be a huge generator, right? So like if you're in an area where this will say the school district has Cigna, you know, that, we're, that might not be the first one that we target as well, right? We're going to be sensitive to that. We're going to go through the patients. Hey, what's the likelihood that these people might stay or how long have they been with us? Do they have treatment on the books now? Are they pre-appointed for some time in the future? We need to look at those kinds of things, right? Obviously, then we need to look at their fee schedules. And before we start saying, let's just cleave off this plan, let's go back and see if we can't move them up the ladder, right? Before we make our final decision on which plans we're going to terminate and in what order, we want to go back and negotiate, or we want to go back and reconsider how to participate to see if we can't move them around, right? Because maybe the answer is that you're going to term six of the eight plans that you're in over the next 24 months, but the order in which you do it may be affected by the fact that you can get more, a better reimbursement you know, in the meantime, right? You know, and so there's some there's things like that to consider. When you participate in networks through third parties, they oftentimes will have more attractive fee schedules, but they'll only access, you'll only access a portion of the patient base, right? So if you participate, for example, with, um, I'm picking on MetLife again here, but MetLife through a third party, like a Connection Dental, only the PDP Plus and FedVIP members are considered in network. So you can kind of take a stepwise out without going fully out, right? Or so, so there's different things you can do. Or like Cigna has two networks, Delta has two networks, you know, and you can say, well, I want to do that network and not that network. So there's a lot of different variables to consider before you put a final plan in place. But yes. regardless of the, the when we do it, one thing that we're always looking for then is, is that um that feedback loop, right? So we say, hey, look, see what this does to your new patient flow, right? And see, and let's make sure the office is trained and understanding how to answer the phone. Because right now they've been answering the phone as yes, we're a network for everything. And now that's not the case, right? And so we've got to master that conversation and we've got to be prepared with objections that we might face from our existing patients who are now out of network for. And so we've got to be comfortable as a team talking about those things and working through those objections. And then we've got to look and see what that does to our schedule. Do we, do all of a sudden do we have a lot of cancellations? Do we have people not reappointing? Do we have the calls slowed down, right? Because we don't want to keep on our path to terminating when maybe that's the realities of our business are changing, right? And so there's this constant feedback loop that you're looking for along the way. And, and also in doing this, you're looking and saying, well, we thought maybe we would keep 60% of the patients, we only kept 30%. How does that affect our next decision, right? So there's things like that that you're constantly looking at. So it's it's very data-driven um, as opposed to, you know, hey, this claim uh, didn't pay the way I wanted it to, and it took us three weeks to get it, and let's just terminate it, right? You know, so because one of the things that I think is really important to understand is people don't go to the dentist like they go to the grocery store. Right. I only go twice a year, Right. And so you may not realize the impact of a decision. Like I read these posts online, they say, I just dropped everything. Things are going great. They haven't noticed any difference like in the first week or two. It's like, well, that's that's not going to materialize for 10 or 15 months. Yeah, right. So um, you've got to kind of do it slowly. And, and, you know, because it takes a long, you you can destroy something much faster than you can build it. Right. So, so you definitely want to move slowly. You want to move methodically. You want to be aware of all the inputs and, and make sure that you're and that's really part of being an investment grade practice is is having the the wherewithal to manage those levers. Right. The visibility and the, and the wherewithal to manage those levers so that you can continue to operate successfully. I love that. We've had. I mean, so many of our doctors, because they're comprehensive and they diagnose by risk factors and they've got a well-educated patient base, but that takes years, you know, sometimes to develop a a well-educated patient base that are referring other well-educated and getting the marketing. We always say insurance is a marketing plan. So I love, you just gave me, I'm going to start tracking the ROI. We track the write-offs, but I want to track the ROI. And 
when I had practices in Wisconsin, we had one insurance that the, the teams were always complaining about, but we knew we wouldn't drop it. So it was TRICARE with the military. Oh, yeah, um, right. Yep. Worst payers ever. But when we went in and analyzed it, the military personnel weren't the people coming in our office. It was their spouses and children. Mm -hmm. And we were out of network for that. And so we would have lost like $150,000 in profit from the extended family that was coming in had we dropped it. So yes, it was a high write-off, but it was a very small percentage of our patient base that came in. So the military personnel, and then we got the, the, buy, the, the families. Mm -hmm. So we were like, whatever, let's have a yeah. military day, make a fun thing of it. Who cares about the write-offs? This is bringing good revenue. So it's, it's about the quality of revenue and how sometimes I think the conversation is becoming, how does the quality of revenue align with my core values? So if, it, and that was one of our core values in that area was to take care and honor uh, our, our military and our veterans. So there was no way we were dropping that plan we just needed to make it work with our overhead. Yeah. And like you said, then you turn it into a nice marketing activity. You say, every, you know, today's military day, everyone come in, you know. Yes. And I think it's really important because, you know, uh, if you're a group or you're somebody looking to go through a transition, uh, they always do a quality of earnings, right? Right. And so quality of earnings is what's left. You know, you, you bring money in, you spend money, and then here's what's left, right? But very few people understand the nuances of revenue, right? Uh, you know, your accountants are really good at understanding how much, what percentage of your revenue you should spend on uh, labor and supplies. And I mean, there's, there's percentages, right? There's ranges that everyone gives three, three to five percent on labs and whatever, right? But very few people have a good understanding about how revenue turns up on the on the profit and loss statement, right? You know, so because it's it's coding. It's right. billing, it's collections, it's your UCR, it's your insurance reimbursement rates, it's the plans in which you participate, it's your ability to sell treatment, right? You know, it's, there's so many different factors to it um, that, you know, when we look at this, like I was talking to a, a, a friend the other day and the ADA came out with the new code for uh, cleanings, right? It was, I forget what the code is, it's 43, 46 or something like that, right? Like three or four years ago. And so we just did a quick look in, at our, our client base and in 2000 practices that we manage insurance participation for less than 5% of them are using that code, right? But it, it reimburses at a different rate than just a standard profi, right? And so there's just a lot of things like that. Like if you started using that code when you, when it was appropriate, then you, you know, I don't know how much, let's say that's an extra couple thousand dollars, right? You know, so right. Um, there's just, so quality of revenue is something that really, when you said that, I was like, oh, that triggered it. Uh, yes. I love that you said there's a nuance of revenue and you're right. It is the, it's perseverance. It's, it's for your, your financial coordinators to know that all, all your claims are going to get rejected first time. You're <laughs> right. It's right. a, it's a right. game. It's well, always resubmit it, it's, it with a narrative and a better narrative and an x-ray and a, you know, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, you, and you've got to know those, you know, like an investment grade practice would know what the narratives requirements are, right? You know, so because they they have a well-oiled revenue cycle. Do you offer classes and coding classes and things like that? What resources do you have for, for we don't? We we work with a couple of partners that that do some of that stuff, but um we 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 identify because we we look at production because it obviously influences our efforts from a negotiations perspective. Mm -hmm. If two practices come to us, they have this exact same fee schedule from, say, Cigna, it might mean different values to them because of the codes that they use, right, more frequently. So if you don't have a very strong hygiene program or perio program, um, you know, that may, may change things. If you're marketing to a, an older population doing a lot of restorations, you know, that fee schedule may be more or less value, valuable to you. So we look at production because it really affects our decision making. And we can identify where we think maybe there's things that are inconsistent or out of line because you might imagine this um, dental utilization is pretty predictable in a large group. So when we look at uh, a dental practice, if we saw that 
you know, there were no fillings and only crowns, you know, that would raise a red flag, right? That would be problematic. If we see that there's not a lot of perio, that's problem. You know, we say, okay, there's an opportunity there, but we don't get into um, helping you, right. you know, the nuance of the diagnose narrative. more or yeah, document more. Right. Yeah. So we, we turn that over to partners. I love that. I love that. If you were working with a doctor today that said, I really want to go towards, um, well, we've answered the question about fee for service. It takes time and you've got to analyze the plans and get a strategy. But what if they were adding a, an associate? Like I had someone the other day and, and I said, oh my gosh, you're writing off like 46% on this plan. <laughs> it was really yeah. bad. It was so obvious. Even you, I think, would drop it for the low. The low. And they're like, no, but we're getting an associate in. And I was like, do you really want to give your associate that hit? Well, it's a, you know, it's a good question. So I have the mindset that, and, and this is not universally adopted, right? So I, so there'll be people that disagree with this, but you, you need to be at capacity, right? Because you have every day you pay the rent, you pay for your malpractice insurance. You know, you have a lot of, of fixed costs. And so if you have idle chair time, I don't necessarily focus as much on the write-off because you, every dollar that you bring in once you cover your fixed costs is incremental in value, right? Until the point at which you have to then change your cost structure. Right. Right. So when you have to change your cost structure, whether that's adding an associate or um, you know, outfitting another operatory or you know, extending your hours, which means your staff's now going to be there longer or whatever, you know, then, then that's a point, that's a decision point to look and see what's the right thing to do, right? Then you're going to start to factor in, okay, well, what is, you know, what is, what does it cost me to operate uh, this facility, you know, per hour? What's the, um, what's the revenue that I'm bringing in? You know, what are, what are the write-offs from the different uh, insurance companies? You just, you start to look at it at that point. So if you're at a point right now where you have idle capacity, I say, keep, keep bringing patients in, right. Until you're full. And when you're full, before you decide to leave a plan, before you decide to add an associate, before you decide to do anything else, um, that's kind of the decision point to look and see what's the most profitable thing for you to do, or what's in the interest of what you're trying to accomplish, bigger vision, big, you know, longer term. It makes so, so much sense when you lay it out like this, it's like, oh, that's easy. That's logical. <laughs> <laughs> if well, only our if only our emotions didn't get in the way. <laughs> right, right. But that's why you have advisors, right? I mean, that's why people come to you. That's why people come to us. I mean, because they need help, right? Um, because they're not experts in the area. They're not always thinking about these things clearly. Um, and so they need somebody to kind of help them, you know, think about things objectively, right? And and if you say, this is what we're trying to do within my sphere of of expertise, then this is how I'm going to, you know, address that. Right. So, and it's not to tell you what you want to hear either. Right. So, right. um, so sometimes we get into, you know, some heated discussions about things because, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to get you to understand what this side of the table, right there, you know, so, um, it, it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. And that's why, but that's why I love the field, right. That's why I love working in dentistry. It, you get to work with so many business owners um, and, and their teams and, you know, and, and make a real impact. I love it. Nick, when my clients say, Victoria, what do I need to do about my insurance? I go, I don't know. Let's call an expert. <laughs> so, um, how would people get in touch with you to, uh, get started kind of evaluating their, their plans and putting into place, uh, you know, a participation strategy? Sure. Yeah. Best way to do it is probably to go online. Our website is www.fivelakespro.com. And on there, you can click the contact us button. Um, you can you know send us an email and uh, we're up, we're on Facebook and Twitter and all the, the social places as well. And all the social media. Um, and we're out and about, you know, we like to see, we like to go out and to shows and see, see different folks. And so uh, we're happy to happy to hear what you're, challenged with and, and see if there's something we can do to help. All right. I'll make sure that Cashmere gets that into our show notes. Thank you so much for your wisdom. I, we really packed a lot of golden nuggets into our time. <laughs> Good news. I appreciate the questions. That was, uh, I like, there's some, you threw some tough ones at me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Investment Grade Practices Podcast. 
If you find value in this episode, help us spread the word by passing it along to a dental friend. Subscribe and give us a like on iTunes or Spotify. Learn more about building your investment grade practice at ProductiveDentist.com today.